Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to JPTV. If you are new here, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really excited to talk about this case. And if you are not new here, welcome back. So please, 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 if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell below so that way you are notified every time I upload a new video. So today we're gonna to be discussing the case of Ryan Ferguson, who spent over 10 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. This story is moving. It is sad in some aspects, but encouraging in another. It just shows you the depths of a father's love, a parent's love, and what any parent would do for their child. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on it. All right, guys, let's get started. I already primed my face with my Milani Bright Side Illuminating Primer. So now we're gonna go ahead and jump right on into this case. So. Today, um, I've been looking forward to speaking about this case for a while now. Um, so we're gonna be talking about two 17-year-old teenage boys in Columbia, Missouri in 2001, and how one night changed the life of both of them. And I, I wanna just put out there in the beginning that it just breaks my heart that you have two young kids who had so much promise and so much time ahead of them that allowed a night of partying to really destroy their future. And so, um, you know, before we jump into the logistics, I, I really want to talk about the one out of the two who ended up being accused for the biggest portion of this crime and was the one that ended up going to prison for 10 years for a crime he didn't commit. So I wanna take you guys all the way back to 2001. October 31st of 2001, Ryan Ferguson and Charles Erickson decided it was Halloween that they were gonna go out um, Halloween party hopping and they were gonna drink, okay? And so obviously they're high school students and so, and 17 years old, so they can't, you know, buy the alcohol themselves and not sure if they actually had jobs. So if they had a lot of money um, to be able to spend on alcohol, but they decide to go out and spend some time drinking. And <clears throat> one of them, Charles Erickson, not only had been drinking alcohol, but he also had been high on cocaine. Okay, so these two boys are out partying and they wake up the next morning and to Ryan Ferguson, it's just another day in his life, okay? So now I wanna talk about Ryan Ferguson. I think it's important in order for you to understand the dynamics of his family and really what his father did to help him get out of prison, to fight for him, to advocate for him. It's such a moving story. And I believe because I learned about what their um, family life was like and Ryan's upbringing, that it really helped me to understand why the dad believed that he was innocent and why he spent 10 years after Ryan was convicted trying to prove that point. So the Fergusons. Ryan was born in 1984, October 19th, 1984. So at the time of the murder, he was 17 years old. He was born to Bill Ferguson and um, Leslie Ferguson, and he was born in Australia. So his parents actually had decided, they met young in college, that after college that they were going to, um, you know, get married and travel the world. And that's what they did. They were world travelers. Um, I was very um, blown away by their story because, you know, not not that we all dream about traveling, but I know for myself at a few points in my life, I thought, you know, I want to travel the world, you know, but that's just not always realistic, right? Um, so, you know, I was just very um, moved by the story of this couple. They seem to really love each other. Um, they ended up, you know, in Australia after a few years, um, you know, their plan was to to only travel for a couple years and then 10 years later and two children and they returned back to Columbia, Missouri. So um, while in Australia, they both started studying to become teachers because I guess in Australia, you could teach in the um, back, what do they call it? Like, I don't wanna say the back roads, but um, 
in the Outback. There we go. You know what helped me think of it is Outback Steakhouse. Anyways, um, they were able to teach in the Outback um, with any kind of um, degree. So it didn't matter what it was. And so that's what they did. And um, they had their first child, which was a girl. And then a few years later, they had Ryan. And um, so Ryan you know, was a very, they describe him as a very loving, um, giving child who, you know, just really loved to be around his parents, which was very, very rare for, you know, young boys. You know, the mom describes him as, you know, someone who, even when he was, you know, 17 years old, you know, during the time of the murder, he was always like, you know, just wanting to be home with his mom and dad. Like they had such a great relationship. And Ryan's dad had decided when he was young, when both him and his sister were young, that he was going to invest in their future, that he was going to be the best dad that he could be, you know, and really love them and teach them what it means to live a life, a fulfilling life, but, <clears throat> you know, a life of following their dreams because that's what he did. And so, when, when Ryan was um, arrested for murder, his dad was just blown away. His dad was like, there's no way that my son did this. Absolutely no way. I mean, he was convinced everything in him. He, you know, it was funny because when his son was first arrested, you know, he walks out of his house one morning and there's a few um, reporters and they're like, is your son Ryan Ferguson? Um, he was just um, arrested for murder. And dad's like, no, it's impossible. Not my Ryan. And they're like, well, is your son Ryan Ferguson born on October 19, 1984? And he's like, yeah. They're like, well, that is your son. He was just arrested for murder. And so now that I've shared with you guys a little bit about the family and just kind of how they grew up and, you know, how the dad described Ryan. Now I'm going to take you to the story. So like I mentioned earlier, it was Halloween in... Um, 2001 okay and Ryan and um Charles but he went by Chuck Erickson um hung out that night went party hopping and as far as Ryan's concerned when that was over he took Charles home and he went home and then that's it okay so two years later basically what happens is um it, they didn't discover who, who killed um, this gentleman. Oh, let's talk a little bit about that. So, um, the man who was murdered, his name was um, Keith Heinholt, and he was a sports editor for the uh, Columbia Tribune. And he had just gotten off work and, you know, was walking to his car in the parking lot, and he was approached supposedly by two gentlemen, um, young gentlemen, that um, tried to rob him for money and they um, beat him over the head with a tire iron and then strangled him to death, okay? So so that's who was murdered. Now, obviously in the town, you know, he was a pretty pretty well known because he was a sports editor. So, um, you know, it was talk of the town. So a couple years later, it's on the news again and they're talking about it again, about the fact that they still haven't found the killers. And Chuck er Erickson is watching the news and he thinks about it and he thinks, he starts, this is his testimony. He starts having flashbacks in his head about that night. And not clear, clear memories, but, you know, just memories that seem to just kind of like trigger him to think, oh my gosh, I think maybe I had something to do with this. And the way he describes it is like a dream. So... Have you guys ever had a dream where it felt so real and you woke up and you, not that you were convinced it was real because you, you know, you woke up, right? It's not real, but it feels real when you're in the dream. That's the way he describes this. So what he ends up doing, um, it is March of, um, 2004 and he decides, I'm going to call the police because I think I had something to do with this. Like I'm having these flashbacks. Why would I have them if I wasn't involved? So he calls 911 and he basically says, you know, um, you know that sports editor, um, Keith Heimholt, who was killed a few years back at the um, uh, Columbia Tribune 
and you know the 911 operator's like yeah and he's like I, I know who killed him and so the next day um which is march 10th he gets picked up by the police you know to tell his story and they take him down to the mm, the police department you know to question him and get and get more details so he starts off when they're interviewing him basically saying what i said like he's telling them like i think you know, me and my buddy got together that night. I'm having some flashes of that night. I think, you know, maybe we had something to do with it. So they take him for a drive to the area where the guy was killed. And they, you know, spend some time driving through there. Hold on one second, guys. So they take him um, driving around in the parking lot and they start asking him questions about that day. Okay, so tell us why you think you did it. And so he starts talking about the flashes. He's like, well, you know, he starts to tell them, me and my buddy, you know, it was Halloween. We were out, you know, getting um, drunk. We ran out of money. You know, um, I think maybe we decided to rob him because we needed money, but I really don't remember. I just, I'm having these flashes and I just can't live with myself. Like I must somehow be involved, okay? So after he, you know, sits with the cops and tells them all this, they start following Ryan. So Ryan notices that there's this big truck following him for a while. And so he finally, you know, pulls into a parking lot. The cops get out. They basically, they weren't even cops. They were in an undercover uh, vehicle. And they basically said that they were from the FBI. Um, and they put him in the back of the truck. And um, so let me share this with you guys. Um, how I even know about this story is there's actually a documentary about it on Netflix. It's called Dream Killer, okay? It's called Dream Killer because this kid is basically saying that he doesn't know if he dreamt that he killed this guy or that he knows that he did because he doesn't remember that night. So that's kind of why it's called that. So in this documentary, they actually show the video of the cops questioning Ryan in, in the car. And he's like, they're like, why would, you know, your buddy make this story up? And he's like, I don't know why he would make it up, but I didn't kill anybody. Like, this is crazy. Like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So obviously, you know, that's as much as they question him. So because he's saying like, I don't know anything. And Eric, um, Erickson is the one that's saying like this happened. So, um, they take Erickson, you know, back down to the, actually into the police station and have a more formal, um, interview where they start questioning him more in detail. And this is what's crazy. Sorry, guys, I'm going to move my camera so you guys can see my face is, and I'm just going to stop putting on some makeup for a minute so that I can kind of, um, tell this part of the story. It's important. So they sit down with him and they show the video clips in the trial of them talking to Chuck. And you could tell that they're actually, that he really doesn't know anything, that he just has these flashes supposedly of thinking that he was involved. So when he sits with the police and they're like, so, you know, what did, what did you hit him with? And he's like, I'm not sure. And they're like, well, we know you hit him with a tire iron, so we know that. And he's like, oh, okay. And and then, and then they get to the part where they're talking about where he gets strangled. And they're like, so, you know, how was he strangled? And he's like, I I really don't know. Like, maybe, like I'm having a, a flash of maybe a t-shirt. And the cop's like, well, we know he wasn't um, strangled with a t-shirt, man. Like, come on. Like, you're lying. But basically making him think that, you know, they have all the answers um, and just kind of leading him to go, okay, yeah, it probably was that, okay? So that's what they base their whole case on, you know? And it's seeming oddly familiar to the Adnan Syed case where the cops are just feeding information to these witnesses to get, because it had already been a couple years and they hadn't solved this crime yet and they wanted to get it solved. And this guy, Eric, and you'll find out, not Eric, oh my gosh. I always say Eric because the last name is Erickson, but this guy, Chuck, you know, you'll find out later, like everything that actually truly happened, but um, he really did not 
remember, he truly didn't remember the logistics of what happened because he was doped up on caf um, cocaine and alcohol. And so um, they really had to lead him the whole time. And it was evident from the, um, you know, police uh, interview. So, so now let's fast forward 18 months later, Ryan's already been in prison 18 months. And, and I do have to say this, when they go to the arraignment, um, the dad asks, like, can we get, can he get bail? Can you set bail? And the judge is like, hmm, let me think about that for a minute. Mm, okay, yeah, $20 million bail. And I guess everybody in the courtroom guessed, like the attorneys, it was the highest bail ever given in the United States for a second degree murder charge. And that's what they were charging him with. It was unbelievable so that he spends 18 months in prison the dad's like doing everything he can and you know he's not a professional like he doesn't he's not an investigator he doesn't know what to do he just knows in his gut that his son is innocent and it's such an emotional documentary like there's times where you hear him and the son talking and I can tell that Ryan just had a very dry personality like that was he it just who he was he wasn't someone that's just you know very outlandish and this extrovert, he was definitely an introvert and he definitely didn't have the best personality. So we're gonna get into this a minute in a minute during his trial, but he ends up taking the stand, which was like, un it's, it's unheard of for this type of a charge that, and to not be prepared, like his attorney didn't even prepare him to take the stand. And I think part of the reason he was convicted was because of his personality, like he just was super, dry he didn't show a lot of emotion and so they took that as guilt which is crazy so fast forward it's 2005 the trial starts and um the opening statement from the prosecution is they basically tell them look there is no physical evidence we're gonna we're gonna let you guys know that right up front there is no physical evidence, but guess what? We don't need that because we have an eyewitness that has come forward that says that him and this other kid did this. So, cause this is just Ryan's trial. It's not both of them. It's just one. All right. So the formal charges are second degree murder and first degree robbery. Okay. The reason why it's second degree murder is because they really couldn't prove that it was a premeditated murder. And you know, by, um, Chuck's testimony, it was just that they needed money and they just decided last minute to rob this guy. So that's why it was um, only second degree murder, okay? So <clears throat> the trial starts, they, they do their opening statements. They basically say there's no gonna be no physical evidence. You're just gonna have this eyewitness testimony. So um, Chuck Erickson takes a stand and he basically, at this point, this is what's kind of funny is that he now seems an expert. Like he is an expert witness. He's getting up there. He's demonstrating the way the guy was killed. He's, you know, you know, a hundred percent sure that him and uh, Ryan did it. Like he's pointing to this is where we did it. This is what was used. Like, whereas in his interview with the cops, like he didn't know anything. Like, oh, I have no memory. Like, and then all of a sudden now he has a memory and it's everything that the cops led him to know and tell. So after his testimony, there's a testimony of two more witnesses and they were both janitors at the Tribune. Um, one was, um, I think his name was Jerry Trump. Let me just look at my notes because I want to make sure I get this right. Yeah, Jerry Trump and Shauna Hant. And um, they were the only witnesses. So Shauna takes a stand first and basically what happens is she gets up there and she says, you know, I heard a bunch of noise outside. So I looked out there and I saw two, you know, young um, men, you know, come out from behind the car of Keith and um, they asked her, you know, were they, you know, what nationality were they? She's like, they were white men. And <laughs> this is what the um, dad says in the documentary. He's like, you know, they asked her every question under the sun about you know what she saw like you know their race you know everything because uh, i guess there was also um she sat down with the police the day after and had them do a sketch of one of the perpetrators 
And the sketch looked similar to Ryan. Um, but this is what's crazy. So they're standing there in court. They're talking to her. They're going through the composite that she did. But they never once say, which in any other trial that I've ever seen or watched or even in a movie, he never said, do you see this person in the courtroom? Never, you guys. Like, never asked her that. And then the prosecutor gets up and he doesn't want to ask her that because then now he's like, oh my gosh, usually that's what the, um, not the prosecutor, the defense attorney, usually it's the prosecutor is the one that asks that question. So because the prosecutor didn't do it, the defense attorney was afraid to do it because he's like, I'm afraid of what she's going to say. So I'm going to stay away from that question. And so nobody asked that question. And so she's sitting there talking about these two gentlemen she supposedly, supposedly saw that she took went down to the police and helped them sketch out and they never ask her is the person you saw in the courtroom okay so sorry you guys i'm scratching my face a lot <clears throat> it is i've told you guys this before in one of my other videos actually it was on my other channel so you guys probably don't know i live in fontana california and it is windy 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 like it gets so bad and this morning i'm looking out my window it is probably about 35 to 40 miles an hour. And so my allergies are just like, like insane this morning. So I apologize in advance if I start sneezing. All right, so now face is done. We're gonna jump on into eyeshadow. I'm just gonna kind of move my camera, just kind of zoom myself in a little bit. I am gonna use my mirror because um, I do have one in front of me, but I just feel like I'm looking down, which if you guys don't mind, I mean, I might just do that. But <clears throat> I'm actually going to be using the Essence Taupe It Up. And I talked about this in my last video. Um, one of the favorites that I bought last year. Um, so I'm going to be using that. So, um, all right. So then the next person that testifies is Jerry Trump. He was the other um, janitor. And now let me tell you a little bit about Jerry. So at this time when he testifies, he actually was just incarcerated for uh, child molestation, okay? So he's he's not the best um, witness as far as like, um, I don't know, someone that you could trust, right? But they interview him anyways, they put him on the stand because they're like, you know, he, he was a janitor, he was there during the time and he says he saw something. So they wanted, you know, to know what that was. So he gets up there and he says basically that you know, the same thing that Shauna said that he heard, you know, some noise outside. He went outside with Shauna and he heard, you know, one of the kids yell out loud, you know, this guy's hurt. He needs help. Okay. Shauna says that she hears the same thing. So, um, they do ask him, they do ask him, do you see one of those people in the courtroom? And he says, yes. And he points to Ryan. Okay. So, Here's the other crazy thing is that from where he stood when he came out of the building, and we find this out later, like there's no possible way that they could have seen, it was dark, it was nighttime, see them that close up to really like give a positive ID. That's, that's just my opinion and it's the opinion of the dad because, you know, as we hear later, you know, when both of these people recant their testimonies, um, that it was just too far for them to see, you know, like to really be able to give a positive identification. So, um, so he, he basically says, yep, it's Ryan points him out. Um, but they ask him, you know, what, what, you know, it transpired to make you want to come and testify today. And he says, well, while I was in prison, my wife, saw the article in the paper about the two gentlemen being arrested. So she knew that I had seen something that night and that I had worked there. So she stuck it in the mail and sent it to me to prison so I could look at it. And he says, when I opened up the envelope, it was folded to just the picture of the boys. Like he didn't even know what the article was even about yet. He just saw the boys and he thought, oh my God, those are the kids that I saw. And then he supposedly flipped it over the article over and saw what it was about, which was the murder of Keith and the boys that were arrested. So <clears throat> that's how he came to testify. So those were the only other two witnesses in addition to Chuck Erickson. So, you know, when I first started watching it, I was skeptical. I'm watching and I'm thinking, okay, like why, 
would this kid just say they did that? Like, he's basically, he doesn't even remember, but he's saying like, we killed this guy and they're gonna go to prison. Like, it just, it was kind of mind boggling to me. And so obviously that reeled me in and I wanted to watch more because I was like, I gotta know like how this actually came to be what happened. So, all right, so now let's, let's move on. So as the trial's going on, his dad starts to realize how bad this attorney is. Like they paid so much money for this attorney that supposedly was the best defense attorney in Missouri or Columbia at the time. And you know, they paid a lot of money for him and he just, it was actually painful for me to watch. They show clips of him in the court where he's like, he'd go silent for like, he's gonna say something and make a point. And then he just thinks for a long time. It's just like Jeopardy. Da, na, 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 na. And I mean, forever before he would say anything. And then when he would say things like, I don't know, they, to me, they just didn't seem intelligent or that they made any sense. And again, it's so familiar to the case about Adnan Syed. Like it just, as I was watching it, I thought, wow, this is just, there's some common denominators and I've only been done research on two cases so far, but common denominators for people who are convicted that are innocent. Now we don't know Adnan is innocent. That's my personal opinion, but we do know Ryan is, okay? So there's a scene <laughs> where the attorney actually, um, there's this map that describes the whole area where this all happened. There was supposedly this diner that they had eaten at that night, um, a bar that they went to. And so the, the dad had walked to the crime scene, like not when the crime happened, but when he knew where the area was because he was trying to envision it, prepare and try to help get his son off. So he knew the area really well. So he even asked the attorney, like, do you want me to, to map out on the map? Because the attorney was going to show, like, they went here, they went there, and whatever he was going to explain. And the dad was like, do you want me to help map it out? And the, the attorney's like, no, 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 I got it. You know, it was just, like, insistent that he do it. And so he was like, all right, fine. And then when it came time to actually go through the map, and I'm not going to go into, deep, like, deep details about that because... I didn't even understand it. Like it made no sense to me. Um, and it was just something that he probably shouldn't even talked about in the trial. Like it, it had no relevancy. Um, it didn't prove innocence or guilt. It did nothing. It actually just embarrassed him because the other, the, um, prosecutor got up and was like, um, this map is incorrect because that diner was no longer in that area in 2001, because I guess it was a diner that had moved and it was just, it was just a hot mess. And so, um, that leads me to the part where Ryan gets on the stand. Okay. And the dad is just like, couldn't even believe it. He's like, oh my gosh, the, our attorney is an idiot and he didn't even prepare my son and he's going to lose. Like this is bad and there's no way that we can like come back from this. Like the dad even knew it. He's just like, because he knows his son's personality. Like he knows that his son doesn't show a ton of emotion. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean he's a murderer. You know what I mean? So um, the dad was worried and, and you know, rightly so. And he should have been because uh, his son was convicted. So, um, so after the trial, I think it was like it lasted a few months. Um, you know, the jury goes to deliberate and it only took them five and a half hours to come back with a guilty verdict of second degree murder and first degree robbery. For the second degree murder, he was given 30 years in prison. And for the um, first degree robbery, he was given 10. So he was given a total of 40 years in prison. And <clears throat> I mean, he just, he broke down and cried um, when the, the um, verdict was read. His whole family, his sister, his mom, his dad. And in the documentary, his dad goes on to talk about how, um, just how painful it was because he knew his son was innocent and he was afraid that he would never see his son again. Like, yeah, he'd see him in prison, but he'd never see him outside of prison. So I don't know how often um, judges do this, but they actually asked him, the family, if 
at uh, sentencing if they wanted to get up and say anything or speak. And so the dad gets on the stand and he basically says like, I am 100% convinced that my son is innocent. And now that I, you know, have had a chance to sit through this trial and see so much more, you know, I know obviously I'm not an expert, but I'm gonna become one and I'm gonna do everything I can, he even started crying, to make sure that I do not die without my son being outside of prison. Like I will give up everything I have to make sure that he is vindicated. And I, um, you know, the son sitting out in, in the courtroom and you know, you could see the tear coming down because he sees his dad's passion and love for him. And you could see that the dad truly was gonna do that. Like he was determined, he's like, that's, that's who I am, that is what's gonna happen and you know, it's gonna come to be. So that is what happened. So his dad spent the next 10 years, 10 years, you know, working towards learning about the case, studying it and doing everything he can to get his son out. And so what ends up happening is he reaches out to, let me just kind of look at the dates here. He reaches out to the um, uh, lawyer that actually helped them and um, he gets all of the discovery, which was like 14 boxes. And he was like, I'm gonna go through this discovery and I'm gonna learn everything I can about what happened, you know, what, what they had on him. Um, he even was like, I'm gonna even talk to these supposed witnesses because the trials are over. So he could, you know, reach out to these uh, witnesses, the, the two janitors um, himself and talk to them. And, and that's what he was gonna do. And so um, that's what happens. Um, so after he gets the discovery, he says he spends like the next six months every single night. Sorry, you guys, this, um, this sun is like, whoa, it's coming in and it's shining off of my mirror. So I'm just gonna close the mirror so I could turn it. There we go, because it was facing the other um, window and it was super bright. So um, he says, you know, and, and he sh they show him in the documentary, like they like kind of replay him walking the streets. Um, and he says, you know, I spent every night just, you know, mulling over these documents, um, walking the area where they supposedly like went that night, like all the different places, the bars, you know, um, the diner. Um, to see what he could, um, you know, really pull together. So, um, okay, so what the dad starts doing is he starts, as I said, he starts walking the crime scene. So he starts going on tours of the crime scene. Like anybody who seemed interested, like I guess someone who had questioned Ryan, a reporter that had questioned Ryan at one point um, misquoted him. So the dad reached out to him and was like, you know, let's talk. They got together and they went to the actual crime scene area, walked in, gave a tour. And it's funny, the dad says that eventually, like he was giving tours all the time. People were getting more and more interested in the case because they saw what the dad was doing. And so people would come out. There was a school that came out, you know, to to study it like as something that, you know, they could write a paper on in school. And, and it started to become talk of the town and the whole town started to want to try to help get him out of prison. It was such a cool thing to see. So after he starts, um, you know, really giving people tours and the town's getting all into it, he decides to create a web page about about it. And he thought to himself, you know, you know what? Like maybe if I create a web page, you know, someone will eventually come out and say something. Like this might be, you know, an area where we could, you know, reach out and tell the community, like if you've seen anything, you know, please, please come forward. And that's exactly what happened. So he gets an email on the website from Shauna Orndt. That was the first um, janitor witness. Remember that we talked about earlier um, that they never asked her, is Ryan the guy that you saw? Okay. So she emails him and says, you know, can you meet up? I have some information. And he's like, sure, can we meet at, you know, the place, like the crime scene? And she's like, yeah. 
And you know, when I think about why the dad does that, I think in his mind, he's thinking, you know, if I take somebody back to that area, it'll be a way for them, I'm just gonna move it down, them to kind of remember what they saw, how far they were, because at the time of this happening, she herself was only 19 years old. So she was young as well. So they're there and he records their meeting and she basically tells him like, well, he starts, he starts off by just asking her like, okay, so you gotta, he's kind of leading her. So you got a really good look at the person that did this, right? And she's like, yes. So she's saying that she did get a good look. That's how she was able to come up with that composite. And he's like, okay, so you're, and you obviously got a good look of Ryan while you were in court, right? And she's like, yeah, pretty much. We were there a long time. I did see him really well. And he goes, okay, so was Ryan the guy that you saw that night? And she goes, 100% no. Absolutely not. He was not the guy. She goes, if anything, Erickson looks more like the guy in the picture that I helped the police come up with. She's like, but I don't think he did it either. You know, I can't even be sure about him. She's like, but I'm 100% sure it was not Ryan. And he's like, she goes, and I even told the police that. And the police basically made me feel like I was the one on trial and basically told me, well, Charles is saying that it was him, so it was, whether you think it was him or not. And they basically made her feel discredited her own uh, her own memory, like that couldn't have been who you saw because, you know, uh, Chuck Erickson is saying that it was Ryan, so it's Ryan. And she says this on camera to the dad and she's just like, I couldn't hold this in anymore. And she's like, and quite frankly, She's like, that prosecutor was <laughs> an ASS. <laughs> She's like, he's so rude. Hold on. So yeah, she pretty much, he gets her to, you know, recant her story, which is great. And you know, she just pretty much said that she was afraid, like the police made her feel afraid. And so that's why she just went ahead with it. All right, so now after he talks to Shauna, you know, obviously he continues, you know, over the next few years to, you know, just dig more into the case. He gets a new attorney for his son. Um, her name is Kathleen Zellner, and she was actually a really high profile attorney as well. She decided that she wanted to take on the case pro bono because she just couldn't believe that they had no physical evidence and they had just the testimony of this guy. So as uh, she started interviewing the people again, digging into the case, and let me back up a little bit. Before she took on the case, the dad bought a billboard, you guys, and billboards are not cheap, okay? I'm done with the makeup, hope you guys like it. But anyways, billboards are not cheap, and so the dad, um, spent all this money on a billboard, you know, in the city, you know, free Ryan Ferguson. Um, I mean, it's just so inspiring, like just seeing everything that he did and pulling the community together. And it just showed how much he truly loved his son. And I believe because of it, that is why Ryan is out today. Because had the dad not made such a, a, a big, um, like event, you know, I don't even, event's not the best word. As he started to do all these things to prove his son's innocence, he, he gained the trust of the community. Um, people wanted to help because people started seeing like, yeah, you know what, maybe this guy is innocent. Like, you know what I mean? Um, you know, what, what can we do to help? And so Kathleen had been, you know, seeing everything that was going on and, and she was like, you know, I wanna take on this case. So. She takes on the case. They start, you know, interviewing everybody, like I mentioned, and she talks to Erickson. She goes to prison and talks to him. And he basically tells her that the prosecutor, Kevin Crane, actually pressured him into implicating Ferguson. He basically told him that, he told the Crane that he really didn't remember the murder. He doesn't remember Ryan doing it with him because he was so intoxicated with drugs and alcohol that he had blacked out, which causes, I guess, I'm reading this here, antegrade amnesia. Um, I'm actually gonna put in the description box every 
where that I got my information. So obviously, you know, the documentary, I'll link it below because you guys got to watch it. You know, uh, hopefully I've, you know, piqued enough interest in you in this video to want to go and take a look at this documentary um, because it was that good. Like, I loved it so much. So anyways, um, he says that and then um, Jerry Trump recants his story, um, basically saying that, oh, the police came up with this idea of my wife sending me the article like that never happened. I had never seen the two guys until I got out of prison and the police were questioning me because they knew that I was there and they showed me the two pictures of the guys. That was the first time I saw them. Um, so he says that and then um, the last person to actually see um, um, Keith alive, his name was Michael Boyd and he actually um, said that when he was questioned, they uh, elicited a timeline from him that placed him with Heinhold at the time of the murder. The court cited these critical admissions in its opinion and Boyd's five conflicting stories were known before the hearing, but he had never been called in to be sworn as a witness. And so there was just so much that screamed um, coercion in this story. Like, it just blows my mind. So so here's, here's what it comes down to, okay? In the end, Erickson recants his story, and he basically says that it was me only that did it. So what he's saying is that Although he doesn't have complete memories of that night, he believes that the flashes are enough for him to know that he did it. And the only way, reason he implicated implicated Ryan was to get an easier sentence. Because let's let's be honest, or just so you guys know, he got less time than Ryan. Um, because you know Ryan was supposedly the one that actually killed him. You know by by strangling him. Um, and Erickson only hit him over the head with a tire iron. And so that's my opinion. Now, is my opinion truth? No, um, but just from what I could see in the documentary, that's what it seems like to me. Um, and so that's how Ryan got brought into this whole thing. And, you know, it comes down to, you know, the whole time Brian was being, Ryan was being honest, you know, like he did hang out with Erickson that night and then he took him home. Oh, and something else that came up, <clears throat> actually in my research, it wasn't even told in the documentary that I can remember, but when it came to the timeline of these boys and the things that they did, Erickson said that they had went to a bar and left the bar around 1.30, and then they went off to look for more money, and then that's when they robbed this guy and killed him. Went back to the bar, that same bar, and was let in by the same bouncer between the hours of 4 and 4.30. Well, later when all this new evidence started to come to light, um, that bouncer was questioned again and he's like, no, we that bar closed that night at 1.30 in the morning. That was when they left and that was the last time we saw them. So Erickson's recollection, it just can't be trusted, quite frankly. And um, so at this point, you know, the judge, uh, you know, decided to vacate his conviction um, and he got out and the moment that his dad in the documentary goes to pick him up from prison. Okay, I feel like I'm gonna cry right now. It was such an emotional moment because you knew in that moment that it was because of a father's love for his child and a father's intuition to know that his child would never do something like this. It drove him to fight where some people may have just given up and said, you know what, like this is a lost cause, it's 40 years and you know, it is 10 years, you guys, 10 years that he fought. It's not like it was, and even when this new evidence came came to light, it's, it's again, very similar to the other case I talked about where they, they knew this evidence five years prior to him coming out and it just took, it just took a while. They're like, nope, it's not gonna happen. And what ended up happening, you know, I don't wanna give away too much, but that prosecutor ends up becoming a judge later. And they just fought it, fought it, fought it all the way to the end and then finally, you know, they got the attention of a judge that, that listened and let him out. And so I'm going to encourage you guys to check out this case. Um, you know, that, that's all I'm going to share in my video. There's so much more, but, um, it's, it's, it's that good. Like I want you guys to, to take a look. So look at that and then let me know if you know of any other cases that you want to hear about that you want me to talk about in my next video. I have a couple in mind. So when I do my next video on Wednesday, 
What we're gonna do on that video is a um, hooded eye tutorial. So if you have a hooded eye and really struggle with putting on your makeup, that's what we're gonna talk about. But in my next murder mystery video, um, I'm not sure who we're gonna talk about yet because I have a couple cases in mind. So um, in my next tutorial, I'll let you guys know who we're gonna talk about. But I, I want any suggestions if you have any, so go ahead and put that in the description box. And if you enjoyed this content, please, please, please like and subscribe to my channel. I'm gonna be doing uh, this type of content every Saturday. We're gonna be talking about different um, cases where people are innocent, either they're still in prison or they're out. I'm, I'm fascinated by both. I feel that the ones that are out, you know, that's great, like Ryan. And now, let's see, in 2001, he was 17 and it's now 2022. Well, he was born in the same year as my brother. So he's like 37 years old and he's now out. Um, and so I feel like, you know, the stories that need to be heard as well are for those people that are still in prison. So that's, that's my take. So my next story, I'd really like to talk about someone that's still there and still fighting to get out, but we'll see. So again, thank you so much for watching and coming. And if you're new, for, new here to my channel, thanks for joining me and I hope to see you again. Bye.